it's not important what we do. What's important is what we create. And so, you know, there's this old thing in the speaking profession. You come up to a, a mason and you say, what do you do? And the mason says, I'm laying bricks. Job, right? You go to a second mason. The mason says, I'm building a cathedral. And so that person has a career. But that's stupid. There's a third mason. And when you ask the third mason what he's doing, he says, I'm bringing people closer to God. That's a calling. See? And a calling you put your passion into. Hi, everybody. This is Jason Mark Campbell. Welcome back to the Selling with Love podcast. I have a legend in the field of sales, in the field of consulting, coaching, etc. It is the one and only Alan Weiss here. He is an entrepreneurial coach, million dollar consultant, a speaker and an author. And this man has taken the stage across over 60 countries, usually does about 20 keynotes every single year. The man has been able to attract clients in his consulting business with names that you might consider uh, quite known, such as GE, Howitt Packard, Mercedes-Benz, uh, the New York Times Corporation's Toyo, and over 500 other leading organizations. The man has written so many books. We're talking 60 books, 500 articles, including his bestseller, Million Dollar Consulting, and we are in for a treat today. We're going to talk more for those of you who are small business owners in the field of services, providing services to other businesses, consultants, coaches, et cetera. We're going to talk a bit more about the journey for him positioning himself as the top level consultant. What are the tips and tools that you can use along the way to do the same and going a bit more specifically on the art of the proposal and why that might be the missing ingredient for you to land the clients that you're looking for. Alan, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. I'm happy to be here. I could just listen to you all morning. Keep going. <laughs> well, I'm not going to be doing most of the talking because we're going to pick on your brain. And what I would say is, you know, you've written a number of books. Most people struggle with writing one. You seem to have pumped out. I think you've revised the book and released a few even on this year. Um, how are you able to have this output in writing so many books? Well, uh, I think that uh, the important thing is that you realize you're not writing war and peace and you go for success, not perfection. I tell people, you know, I go for volume, not accuracy, and some people actually believe me, but that's okay. Uh, the fact is that uh, you can't worry about being perfect. You can't worry about writing for others. You write for yourself. You never self-edit. Uh, and you set up a schedule for yourself. So if you can do that, if you have a command to the language, you can type on a keyboard, uh, and you're not uh, fearful about what people might think, you can write as much as you like. So Million Dollar Consulting, which you mentioned, which is on the shelves for 30 years, comes out in, next week in its sixth edition. And when I wrote that, I didn't take the fifth edition and try to upgrade it. I wrote the book all over again. So it's 85% different from the fifth edition. Uh, for me, that's a lot more fun, for example. Wow. Well, like you said, this was an original copy that came out 30 years ago. You've completely rewritten the book. And we're talking about this field of being a consultant. Are you seeing that things are changing at such a rapid pace that we need to completely update the material? Are we, are we picking up on new trends now? Well, absolutely. I mean, people talk about a new normal, right? There is no new normal. There are new realities, but there's no new normal. And when people talk about a return to normal, they're kidding. I mean, normal means average, right? Normal even means mediocre. Who wants to return to, to average or mediocre? So it's a tremendous opportunity up there. But if you look at social change, technological change, economic change, uh, and uh, changes in technology and so forth, what you see is a combination of these factors that on the one hand can make people fearful and hide under the bed. On the other hand, can say to people, wow, you know, I can really help people in this very turbulent new environment. Well, I was going to say, I've been keeping up or actually not even keeping up. I've been watching some of the developments that are happening in technology. Um, you know, I have one of my friends that's actually talking about these things like the metaverse, this, this whole virtual reality thing. All these things are moving so fast. So even I would think the needs of what companies have when it comes to consulting, keeping up with change, must be changing year by year. And in your case, you were focused a lot on the sales side, on the marketing side. You're even known as a million dollar consultant here. Um, so what is it that you would be able to consistently bring into the organization that they would typically be looking for that is still relevant today? Fresh air. They're hmm. all breathing their own exhaust. Uh, and they get lost in that exhaust and they suffocate. And so they need people from the outside who don't, are not best in the retirement plan, aren't looking for the corner office, aren't looking for a promotion, but can come in and say quite honestly, look, Stop doing that and start doing this. So, for example, I tell clients, any strategy that you had pre-pandemic is no longer effective. I don't care what business you're in. Any strategy that looks at more than a year is just guessing. Stop that. You know, five-year strategies, please. Ten-year strategies doesn't work. You spend a day to put strategy together. So I created a new one called Sentient Strategy, Self-Aware Strategy. So, you know, I, I walk my talk. Uh, and 
I find that um, businesses have to be confronted. You know, <clears throat> I'll tell you what tough love is with my clients. Uh, sympathy is feeling sorry for someone. Empathy is understanding how they feel. I provide empathy without sympathy. So I'm not going to commiserate with how terrible things are. But I am going to tell you, hey, look, I know where you are. I've been there myself. And here's what we have to do. Speaking of the truth doesn't seem so easy. And I think that's kind of like you said, you don't want to be breathing your own exhaust. What is this blindness that seems to happen within an organization? You would think you could see it while you're in it, but are we just blinded to it? Churchill had an interesting quote. He said, we build our houses, then they build us. And he was talking about parliament. But the fact is we construct these organizations and they start to build in their own filter system. And so people don't hear the truth. People are afraid to tell the truth. There are consequences for the truth. And, and people just want to get by, get through the day, you know, want to fly under the radar. And if you look in some organizations, the people who make senior executive or senior partner are the people who have never been on the radar screens. You know, they've been hugging the earth. Uh, and that ain't good, you know, because they want to reinforce that system. So uh, organizations, here's an example. You have to use disruption and volatility, right, which we talk about all the time as pairs. It sounds like a law firm, right, disruption and volatility. We have to use disruption and volatility as offensive weapons not hunker down, not protect ourselves. But if you want to dominate a market, you have to disrupt it. And if you look at Dyson or FedEx or Uber or Apple or any of these companies that, that have had such strong starts and continuing strengths, they disrupted their markets and they continue to do so. It's almost like you have to have a department within your own company to disrupt yourself before somebody else comes around the block and does it for you. Well, that's why you need outside consultants because what you just described is very difficult. It's like saying to someone, change your own culture very difficult because cultures reflect belief systems. Hmm. And so as you just went out, you've rewritten this whole consulting playbook for the million dollar consulting. What is one of the things that you might think people that are in consulting right now, maybe our coaches right now might not even been seeing as their own blind spot. Is this industry itself blinded to a certain aspect or are we too much into it to even see it? Oh, well, I think that people are fearful. Uh, I think they have self-esteem problems. So when I started writing about fees, you know, uh, value-based fees, just about this third edition and so on, and it's really in all my books, I started to ask myself then, well, why don't people just charge more? I mean, what's stopping them? Why do I have to give you a formula? And then I realized they were afraid. It was a self-esteem issue. They didn't feel they were worth it. They felt they were imposters. And the problem with our profession is that people don't appreciate their expertise. So they call themselves a coach, a facilitator, a consultant, a speaker, you name it. But that's just a, a thing what they have to understand is for all of us, it's not important what we do. What's important is what we create. And so, you know, there's this old thing in the speaking profession. You come up to a, a mason and you say, what are you doing? The mason says, I'm laying bricks. Job, right? You go to a second mason. The mason says, I'm building a cathedral. And so that person has a career. But that's stupid. There's a third mason. And when you ask the third mason what he's doing, he says, I'm bringing people closer to God. That's a calling. See? And a calling you put your passion into. And in this profession, we're too focused on making money instead of our calling, you know? And I can always make another dollar. What I can't make is another minute. And that is uh, allocating the resource value to where it belongs. And so if a lot of people are jumping into consulting, and it's almost like because they come in with the initial mindset thinking, why, this is going to be better than my job. I'll be doing something that's maybe closer to what I like, and it's going to bring me the buck. Maybe that's why I got into it. It could be one of these reasons. Can we shift towards making it more of a calling? And is there a certain exercise you can do to be more of the mindset to be at that higher level so you can actually start growing and valuing yourself more? Yes, yeah, matter of fact, there is. And the, the, the funny thing is that a lot of people, as myself, are refugees from large companies. And so they leave a large company, go out on the road, and now they have a worse boss. You know, uh, When I wrote Million Dollar Consulting in, what, 1992, uh, Atlantic City, New Jersey is a shore resort here. And... I learned that a palm reader, a psychic, on the boardwalk in Atlantic City needed more government licensing than a consultant. There was no barrier to entry as a consultant, but there was for a palm reader. So my answer to your question is this. We have to consider ourselves experts, not consultants or coaches or trainers or anything else. We have to look at ourselves as experts and ask, what's the best way to disseminate our expertise to improve the client's condition? And what we have to ask is, eventually, when I walk away, how is the client better off? And so it has to be a result orientation. Too many people default to training. Let's put people in a classroom. You know, training is, I don't know, a $100 billion industry in the United States alone. It does virtually nothing. Because unless there's application on the job, all you've done is punch someone's ticket. So to answer your question, people have to identify what is my passion? What am I really competent at? And what is the market need I can address? 
because these people you talk about who are deciding to go into consulting, as you put it, uh, have to understand this is the marketing business. I'll stipulate you're great at what you do. You know, I coach people all over the world every day. And I'll stipulate you're good at what you do. You're great at what you do. But you better get good at marketing or you're not going to make it. I think it's one of the most undervalued skills. I mean, myself, I'm writing my book first time being selling with love. So I'm all about telling people, hey, loving is the most beautiful thing and you should do it more abundantly. But I'm faced with one client. I'll, and I wanted to, to, to hear your opinion on this because you just talked about one of the most important things is something the market needs. I have a client has super specialized skill, does something that's of a craft, of an art, but there's no market for it. And they're like, it's, it requires more money, it requires more skill, but there's alternatives that are cheaper, more effective, and there's no way to prove the extra value. They're just putting in more work to create a product that is quote unquote better, especially as them as an artist. For these artist focused or craft focused entrepreneurs that aren't even paying attention to the market because they just want to put their idea forward, do you often just do that empathy without sympathy method? And what do you typically would do? Well, I do. I find those people. And you know, I have people, somebody like that just the other day. And the fact is that you need this trifecta. You need a market need and competence and passion. If you don't have market need, but you have competency and passion, you've got a message no one wants to hear. And so marketing is about what? Marketing is about creating need. Sales is selling into that need. Marketing is about the creation of need. You can have strategic marketing or tactical marketing. And so unless they learn to do that, and I mean, a lot of artists have been very successful. I mean, some artists have sold just a white canvas. Andy Warhol, what, sold Campbell's soup cans. Uh, you know, Jackson Pollock sold really strange things. And so consequently, you can create need. And so stop moaning about that. Don't tell me people don't understand you. It's because you haven't made yourself understood. And so the, the key is that marketing is for everyone. And it's part of the capitalistic system. And you might as well get good at it. I agree. Just reminds me, I was out in Miami back in 2019 and at the Art Basel Festival, it was a, a taped banana on the wall that won the uh, the art piece of the, of the gala. It was quite the statement. And hey, there you go. So you got some good marketing happening right there. We often have, you know, a love-hate with marketing. I know for me, a lot of people I deal with is about having negative associations with sales. Marketing kind of falls in that same boat too. What do you typically tell people who might have resistance around marketing themselves and don't want to embrace the reality of what it is and how necessary it is? People wake up in the morning in one of two conditions. They wake up saying, what a gorgeous day, what a great opportunity. I wonder who I can help today. Who can, who can take my value, right? And then there are the people who wake up and say, oh God, another long, slow crawl through enemy territory, right? Every morning, I let my dogs out in the yard. You know, it's about an acre uh, and it's always been the same yard. And every morning they do the same thing. Oh my God, the yard is still here. And they're excited all over again. Every morning, same yard, they're still excited. And so what I tell people is, if you feel you're providing something for people, value, you have no qualms about contacting them, about talking to them, about interceding, because you're helping them. If you feel you're trying to sell people things in order to get money for yourself, you're gonna be very concerned that you'll be seen as somebody who's interfering, as somebody who's an irritant, as somebody who's trying to take something. So the, the dichotomy here is, are you trying to give or are you trying to take? And I think if you go with the give attitude, you're gonna start falling in love with marketing and sales and you'll actually make a difference and it's gonna work. And the end result is more money in your pocket too, so. You want, you've got equitable compensation if you provide value. You know, just think about it. If you approach somebody and say, uh, listen, I want something from you, you know, they're going to start to close up. If you say, hey, I have something for you, they're going to say, well, what is it? It's, it's that simple. Well, I talked at the beginning, we'd, uh, we'd even go over one of the topics I know you've extensively wrote about, which is all about the art of writing the proposal that people just say yes to. Um, speaking of asking and being in a giving environment, what are some of the key things you would suggest for people who are writing proposals, trying to earn business, maybe some things that are typical mistakes that people make when it comes to putting out a proposal for what they're offering? Well, this is included about a dozen of my books, and it became so popular, I wrote a separate book on it called Million Dollar Proposals. Right? Here's the thing about a proposal. It has to be based on conceptual agreement with the client. And you have to get that conceptual agreement when you're with the buyer, not a non-buyer, not a human resources person, not a you know, learning and development person. They're never buyers. <laughs> a line executive, right? A proposal is a summation. It is not an exploration. It's not a negotiation. And it's a summation of the following. Objectives, measures, and value. That is what I call conceptual agreement. Objectives are those business outcomes that the client wants to achieve in the project. A business outcome is not aligning people internally. It's not making employees happy with the culture. That has no, people have been 
better communicators and companies that have gone bankrupt, right? So it's got to be a business outcome, increased profits, lower retention, better branding. Measures, metrics, are the measures that tell you you're making progress. So here's where we want to go, and here's how we know we're getting there. And then thirdly, value is the impact of hitting the objectives. And so you might think, well, profit's an objective. It's also a value. No, no. If you improve profit, the value is you can increase salaries, you can pay off debt, you can increase investors, you can increase your physical property, and so on and so forth. So you have to look at these very carefully. But once you have objectives, measures, and value, what I call conceptual agreement, you have the basis for your proposal. And the rest is easy. You do a situation appraisal, you provide options, because when you provide options, you move people from, should I do this with him, or how should I do this with him? And that can increase your hit rate by 50% right there. So instead of, should I go forward, how should I go forward? That's what options do. You put your terms and conditions and your fees in the proposal. When you provide a proposal to someone, you say, I'll have it for you tomorrow, and I'll call you the day after, and we'll see which options you want to pursue. That's how you do it. That's a masterclass in itself. Thank you so much, Alan. Right I'm going to tell people um, what we're going to do in the show notes is we're going to add a ton of links so you can discover more of the books, literature, and programs that are available by Alan. Because as you can tell, he has a wealth of information on all the topics that can really get you unstuck if you are growing your small business and really getting it to the next level. I want to highlight one thing you mentioned, the proposal about putting your terms, putting your payments in, which touched on an earlier point that you said, which is some people are afraid of asking for the value that they provide. They price themselves too low. They're afraid to be clear on how much they should charge uh, that would be adequate for the value they provide. We talked about having, you know, those self-esteem issues. Is it purely just self-esteem or are there other fundamentals we should be working on to put in place so that we are confident with whatever price we bring forward? All right. Great question. And before I forget, by the way, my, um, my website is alanweiss.com, A-L-A-N-W-E-I-S-S.com. And there's free newsletters and free podcasts and free video and free audio and so forth. So feel free to make use of all that stuff. I'm, I'm giving that to you. Uh, in terms of the proposal, we talked about the philosophy here, you know, objectives, measures, value. Let's get that with the buyer. But here's a tactical issue that in response to the question you just raised. And that is, you want to provide a buyer with a 10 to 1 return at least. And so when you're understanding these objectives, the value part, objectives, measures, value, the value part is to monetize it. And so what's it worth to reduce attrition by 10%. What's it worth to improve profits by 5%? What's it worth to have a brand that attracts people so there's no cost of acquisition? And if you have a $2 million improvement, which of course would be annualized, right? You'd get that every year, but let's say a $2 million improvement, $200,000 investment is a 10 to 1 return. There's no place your buyers are getting a 10 to 1 return unless they bought Apple stock in the 70s, right? So you just can't do that today. I'll say something else, and that is that um, there's a difference between budget and money, and people don't appreciate this. And, you know, I believe in the 1% solution, which is if you improve by 1% a day, in 70 days, you're twice as good. Not enough people do that. And so for your listeners here today, maybe this is the 1%, and it's this. A client will say, a buyer will say, we have no budget. Well, of course you have no budget because you didn't expect to be talking to me. You didn't budget three months ago for somebody you never met. You know, of course you have no budget, but you do have money. And that is, you've allocated money in different budgets. You can reallocate it. You can take money from over there and invest it in me because I'm giving you a better return than you're getting over there. And that's the secret of the 10 to 1 return. You can say, what, what kind of return are you getting over there investing this money in, you know, uh, painting, your, <laughs> painting the walls in the, in the call center? You know, that's costing you 300000 right there. What if you paid that to me? And so... <clears throat> You have to understand that there's probably not budget, but there's always money. I love it. And I find that if you're doing B2B sales, you're really solving problems. And there was a, a gentleman I was speaking with, his name's Roger Hamilton. He said, it's fun when it's doing B2B because your job is to put money back into their pocket. But when you're in the B2C, you're actually taking money from people. Um, do you advise people that are consultant coaches to focus more on business solutions? Or, or do you often see some benefits in doing the B2C as well? Well, I respectfully disagree with that definition because... When you're doing B2C, you're not taking money from people. You're receiving equitable compensation for value provided. That's far different. I mean, if you buy a car you love, you don't say the dealer um, stole from me. He took, uh, you know, $100,000. What you say is, I love this, love this car. And so consequently, you have to look at this very, very differently. And when people ask me the basis for my fees, because, you know, I, I never, I eschew charging by any time unit. That's amateur bill. So when people do say to them, well, what's the basis for your fees? I say to them, 
uh, I provide you with a dramatic return on your investment in return for equitable compensation. And that's how partners work. And you have to get used to saying that. And if you don't have self-esteem, it's hard to say that. When I was mentoring people long ago, I would tell them to look into a mirror and say the fee is $50,000. And they would say the fee is the fee is $30,000. And I'd say, well, the buyer too tough? You're looking in the mirror. So, but it's, that's a real story. And uh, people are just afraid to charge more uh, uh, because they think they're taking. Uh, and I would bet that over 90% of your listeners are over-delivering and undercharging. Or if they're going to get into this business, they will start doing that. Well, I'm hoping this is going to be the audio that they listen to that gives them that shift of perspective. And, you know, it's so funny because we spend a lot of time on this podcast actually bringing people that help you work on mindset. And oftentimes you're like, okay, I've done enough mindset. Now I just want to know the answer. I just want to know the tactic. Give me that one thing I need to do and then I'll have success. But it's, it's fascinating even for myself. Like it always comes back down to mindset. And so in closing, I was going to ask you, you have and seem to have refined quite the mindset for yourself with all the achievement, all the drive that you have. Where did this fascinating mindset start from? And what was that, that um, a pinnacle goal that you set for yourself by going into this business? You know, it's interesting. Um, the reason you and I schedule this the way we did is in another half hour, I have to do a, a Zoom workshop on se- what I call sealing the watertight doors. And that means that uh, I've identified the fact that when we all began, I mean, I was poor when I grew up and I was fired when I went into this business. My wife and I had very little money in the bank and a lot of debt. So when you start, um, you're in a position of, of um, striving. Uh, you're in a position of surviving, right? Uh, and so you do anything you can to kind of survive. If you're successful there, you're at a level I call alive. And that is you stabilize things, you begin to get business. Then you go to arrive. People come to you, they hear about you, you're putting money away. And then there's thrive. The trouble is that people slip backwards. And even though I'm on a thrive level business-wise, I'm still acting like I'm barely survival. You know, I'm, barely survival. I'm not spending money, I'm not sharing anything. Uh, and so this is a mental set. Uh, you have to move from a scarcity mentality to an abundance mentality. And what that takes is stop being afraid. What it takes is stop being fearful. One example, my father was a paratrooper in the Second World War. He defended Australia by jumping into Lay, New Guinea with people shooting at him as they jumped, right? A lot of his unit was wiped out. Uh, But he survived the war and he lived to 99 years and 11 months. Uh, And I said, how did you do that? And he said, well, I just assumed it wouldn't be me and I did my job. What I tell people is when you walk into a buyer's office, no one is shooting at you. No one's going to take your money. I never walked into a buyer's office where I walked out poorer. I mean, if I didn't get a business, I learned something. So nobody's shooting at us. So we have to get rid of this false fear we have. We have to stop letting our egos determine how we act. And we have to stop wanting to be loved. You don't get love from your clients. If you want love, get a dog. I have two dogs. Alan, this was... What a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much for your time. We've covered so much in short amount of time. Everybody listening, this was a waterfall of information. So for you looking to grow your business, we've covered so many things from how to structure your proposal with a possible script you can use, lines you can use, ideas you can implement within the way that you pitch yourself as well. We talk about why the mindset's so important and all the different aspects that we've covered in this podcast are going to be things you can apply right away. But of course, We're just touching the tip of the iceberg of what you can learn with Alan. AlanWeiss.com, the website is where you can find so much more, including the podcast, links to books, articles, blogs, et cetera. I will make the link available in the show notes. And again, Alan, this was a powerful conversation. Thank you so much for spending time with me. I will wish you the best on your boot camp. And to the next time that we speak, um, I look forward to that conversation. Jason, thank you for inviting me. I had a great time. I am your host, Jason Mark Campbell, and this is the Selling with Love podcast.